Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Steve Pardue, one of the managing members at Elevate Oral Care. Before we start, let me cover a few housekeeping notes. For those of you remaining online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate, certificate will be automatically emailed to you within an hour of the end of the talk. Please be sure to check your spam folder for that file. You're muted, so don't worry about background noise. And we'll have time at the end of the presentation for questions. You can submit questions through your webinar dashboard, and I'll track those questions throughout the talk. Over the past two years, we've held a series of free live CE webinars on topics aimed at preparing dental offices for necessary changes to patient care. Each of these webinars was recorded and are available with free self-instruction CE at the web address that you see on the screen, elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. Bookmark that page and return often to see what's new in free CE. We're putting together our 2021 and 2022 free CE calendar, so feel free to suggest topics by emailing us at info at elevateoralcare.com. We're honored tonight to host Dr. Jeremy Horst, a recognized expert in prevention, to present us the science and suggested uses of iodine for caries prevention. The ADA Health Policy Institute reported that the court surveyed dental practices have observed an increase in caries activity of over 20% since reopening following the pandemic shutdown. Caries is a multifactorial disease requiring multiple prevention strategies, and iodine provides offices yet another tool to help patients achieve oral health. Dr. Horst will cover the facts and myths on the use of iodine of oral disease prevention. Dr. Jeremy Horst is the Dent Director of Clinical Innovation at CareQuest and holds affiliations with University of Washington and UC San Francisco. As a practicing pediatric dentist, biochemist, and educator, he's known for investigating the strengths and limitations of silver fluoride therapy and helping to develop smart fillings. His mission is to reduce the suffering from tooth decay by driving de deployment and development of better treatments and preventives to stop dental caries and thereby create an easy relationship to, dentists, to dentistry for all. Dr. Horst, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much, Steve, and all the folks at Elevate who continue to be just um, wonderful partners in improving oral health for all. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the honor of your time. Um, I do not take lightly that so many of you uh, continue to show up for these events. Uh, I hope to uh, entertain, but really hope to share something very useful and, and relatively novel, I would say, overlooked and forgotten um, with you all today that I know if you're here, um, you're not just here for yourself, you're here for your patients, you're here for the other clinicians uh, who you uh, mentor, advise, influence, uh, and their patients. And um, I think you're, if you're here, you're probably also here to just improve oral health for everyone. So thank you very much for being here. Um, as some of you may know, about a year ago, I joined um, uh, what was then called the uh, DentaQuest, and, and we split off a contingent of us. Uh, uh, we are still the innovation group uh, for DentaQuest, uh, but we are now CareQuest Innovation Partners, um, and I'm very excited about that and the work that I've been doing there. Um, this particular lecture is sort of my, uh, my free time work um, that I do, uh, but certainly it falls well within the work that I do um, at CareQuest Innovation Partners. And so, um, yeah, it was almost a year ago. I guess I, I started August 17th. Anyway, enough about me. We're here to talk about, uh, about iodine and, um, and really, um, again, just one more time uh, for the lawyers. This is, uh, this is my view and the view of all of the publications that we reference um, and all of the publications that there are on this topic, um, which we'll start in on. Now, what prevents cavities? Uh, if you're here, you know about Elevate, you know about me, you know about iodine and caries, I'm sure you have a very good sense of the answer to this question, uh, that it's complex, there's lots of things, there's stuff we can do for ourselves, there's stuff that can be done to our teeth. Um, I would say the top, my top answer to this is removing sugar stagnation. So to me, that really puts a lot of things together, in particular, sugar being paramount, paramount and that it takes time uh, for sugar to do its evil tricks. So if, um, if the sugar just goes right through the oral cavity and doesn't stick on the teeth, it's probably not gonna cause cavities, uh, probably gonna cause lots of other problems. Uh, if you have sugar and brush and floss immediately or get a professional cleaning, you're probably gonna be fine. 
uh, or just consuming less sugar. So here's a few of those uh, ways to achieve this. Um, less sugar intake, better nutrition. Uh, it, it has been, I think, overlooked for the last 70 years or so. Um, all the wisdom that was gained in the first half of the last century about the importance of different aspects of nutrition, in particular vitamin B6 and vitamin Ds and perhaps vitamin K2 on uh, salivary function and protection from caries. Um, and, and so back to the, to the sugar, specifically removing plaque traps. So that could be placing a sealant in a, in a fissure. Um, it could be smoothing down an area, not done so much here. Um, uh, and more hygiene also helps, right? Brushing and flossing well all the time can help, uh, but probably more effective is reducing sugar. So I say this because, and I have this slide, although the rest of the talk is gonna be about iodine, because I think it's very disingenuous to talk about cavities, fillings, restorations at all uh, without talking about the cause of caries, uh, which I think, you know, the bacteria certainly contribute and the bad actors are no good and iodine works against them, but really it's a sugar disease. Um, another thing we can do is increase acid resistance uh, via fluoride or the saliva. That helps, obviously, fluoride works, yay. Uh, and substantive antimicrobials. Um, I would put these last two together underneath sugar. Uh, so to me, there's the big, the big S word, and then there's F for fluoride and um, substantive antimicrobials. And so if you are here and you don't know the word substantive, um, I was there, look it up. Basically, it's like, just like, I don't know, it's probably just like the most important thing in dentistry. It's like stuff sticking around, staying around, staying present. Um, and it's this topic that's never taught, but uh, substantivity is just, um, it's just, uh, it's the reason why silver works. Silver, diamine, fluoride, the silver in there absorbs into the porous parts of the teeth and it stays there. So it's that substantivity. Uh, there's much more effective antimicrobials that kill bacteria or prevent their growth better than silver, but the silver is magic because it stays there. And the fluoride is magic because it stays there. It incorporates into the tooth and continues having its function. Um, and as you might guess, the reason that I am bringing this up in particular is that iodine does as well uh, in a different way, which we'll get into. Um, before I go any further, back to the sugar and behavior change, um, at least, I don't know, 20 times a day, uh, I meditate on this uh, lecture that was given by Dr. Lena, um, and, and it it's, was part of a global symposium on minimally invasive dentistry, and it is up for free uh, on this particular website, the No Decay Educational website. Um, about halfway through her hour-long lecture, which is the eighth in the in this URL uh, on this website, uh, about halfway through, she um, starts talking through uh, example discussions she has with her patient. She role plays uh, from direct experience, and um, I want to be like her. <laughs> I want to build this skill of behavior change, but she's able to control carries uh, without lifting a drill without lifting a needle, um, most of the time without using any of the modern things that we use now, like glass anamer and silver diamine fluoride, um, by helping patients and families to change their behavior. And so I strongly urge you um, to drop off this lecture and go watch that one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> After you're done with this one, go watch that one. Uh, it, is, um, it is my final frontier, I think, is that behavior change. And, and she is, is one of the few people on earth who I think really is there. Okay, so for the rest of our time today that we will spend, um, we're going to go through these seven things. Uh, what is iodine? What's this all about? Mechanisms? How does it work? What's going on there? Laboratory and clinical microbiology uh, as it relates to dental caries, um, clinical caries prevention, so the evidence, the clinical trial evidence on uh, preventing caries, uh, safety, some myths, uh, my recommended protocol, and maybe, just maybe, we can use this stuff for treatment, just a little exploration of that possibility. So what am I talking about with iodine? I'm literally talking about povidone iodine, uh, the stuff that you can get at any drugstore almost in the world, um, 
betadine, uh, you know, povidone iodine, 10%. Uh, this is the product we're talking about. Now, as I will mention a few times, because of my gratitude uh, to Elevate, um, and because of um, about 11 years of trying to get folks to do this and, and not being successful uh, on my own with the with the Q-tip and uh, and bottle and uh, Daffin dish or shot glass or whatever you like, um, Elevate is making a dental product, uh, which we will talk about later. So there's a there's a dosed product uh, for us all to use and to give to our patients to use at home, at home, um, to use this just this 10% povidone iodine. Uh, so all of these are relevant. We're talking about all these products, and it's all really the same technology, the same 10% propanone iodine. Iodine. There's a big story here. We'll get into the safety stuff later. Um, but the first step to know about iodine, if you don't, um, is that it is, a, it is a necessary nutrient. It is an obligate nutrient um, because of its role in the thyroid hormones. It is such a necessary nutrient. Um, that if you do not have enough iodine, which is about 20 micrograms a day at least, your neck will swell up uh, permanently um, in response. And there's different mechanisms of that. Um, but it is a very big deal. Your thyroid hormones have a profound effect on your body, on your sense of well being, on your metabolism. Uh, hyperthyroidism is no joke. Hypothyroidism is no joke. Goiter is no joke. Uh, iodine is important. A balanced intake of iodine is important, um, and the safety profile of it is very well established. This isn't something new or just dental or anything. There is very good data on all of this. And so uh, I would clue you into the, what is this, the sixth and seventh line here, uh, sorry, fifth and sixth line here, no, six and seven was right, um, that uh, it's really about that 10 micrograms per kilogram a day Underneath that, you can do that every day, every day of your life, and, and really there's no problem. And, and then above that, certain susceptible people start to um, start to have a reaction if they do it every day, every day, every day. And all this fun stuff here from top to bottom is a little silly to go into detail for what we're talking about of painting a little povidone iodine on the teeth um, uh, four to six times a year, so every two, three, or four months. So the, the average addition of iodine from doing that doesn't even get to the dosage that you need to avoid goiter. So you're not preventing goiter with doing this a few times a year. Um, uh, but the rest of this is, is here for your use. And of course, Elevate will be posting this on their website uh, where you can access this material later. You can screenshot or whatever's good for you. Um, but this comes from the US, uh, from the EPA, from the NIH and the CDC um, cumulative data. So. Uh, I will just alert you to the idea here that, um, you know, uh, what did I say? 10 micrograms per kilogram per day. So I'm about 85, 90 kilograms. Um, so that's about a milligram. So I can have about a milligram uh, a day and be fine. Um, three milligrams is about the maximum of the variance of a sheet of seaweed. So if you like sushi or nori, um, you know, you're, you're often consuming uh, much more iodine than will be done in a, in a single dose here. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that isn't causing any problems to almost anybody. Uh, but here's the list, here it is. Iodine's important. Um, what is povidone iodine? So here's the chemical structure of uh, polyvinyl, polyvinyl uh, pyrrolidine, pyrrolidone, povidone for short. Uh, PVP iodine. And um, here's sort of a three-dimensional structure that's pretty cute uh, from a recent review. And what you see, what the important thing is the PVP is the red and blue long chain. And the, um, and the brown dots are the iodine. And so really, um, this is a, a I, I consider it the first nanotechnology. Um, it is a, a polymer that holds in iodine until it gets diluted enough or things change for the iodine to be released. And so there's sort of this important piece here of this I3. The I3 is interesting because I3, so that's three iodines together, um, is not active. And so if you have a concentration that's high enough, the I3 has this negative charge and stays with the povidone. But as you dilute it, I3 turns to I2 and I2 escapes 
and I2 is the one that does the magic against the bugs. So all this to say, um, this is the structure of, of povidone, and iodine, it helps to hold iodine uh, until it's ready. How do we translate that into the sciences stuff? So this is a really cool plot from back in, back in eh, not that long ago, just, you know, almost 40 years ago. So starting at like 10% um, povidone iodine, this is the, this is the, basically the bacterial kill. So you start off at, at three, this is a log scale. So you have like a thousand bugs and you add povidone iodine full concentration right onto the bugs in the laboratory in a totally unrealistic setting. And you get some kill, you get some bacterial kill um, in 15 seconds. You wait long enough, you get a lot more uh, bacterial kill, the bugs die down. But if you dilute it just a little bit, tenfold, hundredfold, then you kill all the bugs uh, very quickly, less than 15 seconds. Um, and so what's interesting about povidone iodine, uh, yeah, here's the concentrations tenfold. So these, this is all logarithmic scale, not linear. Um, but if you look at it, what happens here is that as you dilute, the concentration of iodine in the solution increases logarithmically. So this is like, it's basically an exponential curve if you did it on a linear scale. Um, so that when you dilute tenfold or a hundredfold, all the iodine comes out. So this is like an activated release of an antimicrobial that as soon as you paint it on the teeth, you let it soak in where it needs to go uh, into the proximal areas, uh, into the pits and fissures. As soon as the saliva comes back and starts diluting it, then the iodine comes out and kills the bugs. Um, so it really uh, keeps the iodine stable in solution when it's in the package or the bottle or whatever. And then when it goes onto the teeth, boom, all the iodine comes out and is ready to kill these bugs. Um, and so that is one of the big messages of povidone iodine is that we kind of need this high concentration so that it's stable until you put it on the teeth. And then with the natural dilution process that happens in the mouth, boom, that activates it, kills the bugs. Um, and that's what is magic. So that's one of the mechanistic take homes is that iodine release um, with dilution is super cool. The other mechanism, um, and I know that this is going to be on like the, the pediatric dentistry boards in like three or four years and the cariology boards whenever they start, um, is, is this mechanism, is that iodine really pretty specifically deactivates um, these, these functional rings, uh, these functionalized rings in, in like DNA, protein, and RNA, um, really specifically when you have like a, 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 a benzyl ring, a, you know, all, all the base rings, I don't want to get too into the chemistry, but if there's any sort of um, pull of electronegativity outside of the ring, that lets iodine come in and get in there. And as soon as you have iodine in there, um, it will not act normally. The protein will unfold, uh, the DNA will unfold and not be able to work in the normal enzymes that use it. Uh, and that bug will not be able to do its daily business. You will, you will kill the bug. Um, so like silver, it's sort of a wrecking ball in that it's, it's relatively non-specific in which microbes you would think that it kills. We'll get into that because there's some kind of lucky magic with uh, caries. Um, but it, it will, if you expose it to really to any protein or any DNA or RNA is going to um, make it not functional. So it's all sort of, it's all about the, what protection the bug may have against this or what particular susceptibility um, a, a bug might have against this. And so this is a good time to mention that, of course, povidone iodine and iodine of any type, um, if it's high enough concentration, will deactivate uh, COVID. So a lot of folks have been using this for um, as a pre-rinse before dental treatment uh, to decrease the, COVID, the active uh, COVID that could be um, in the mouth. And actually, some hospital staff, uh, a lot of hospital staff have been using it for a rinse to deactivate the nasal cavity. Um, I'll get back to that later. But again, the iodine adds on to these rings um, by ortho substitution. If you know what ortho is, we're not talking about orthodontics, but it's the, right next to uh, where there's a functional addition to the ring. Now, so th those were sort of two mechanisms, right? We had, um, we had the, the dilution, release, kill. We have adding iodine onto the functionalized ring. Um, and now what, it, how do we, what? Uh, so, if you've been around here before, uh, you know we've said this before, dry, apply, and then paint on the fluoride varnish. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so this is our illustration 
of how to do this. You take any 10% povidone iodine, um, dap and dish, shot glass, whatever you'd like, uh, use, usually eight drops is perfect. Um, and then you saturate one end of a cotton swab, like a Q-tips cotton swab. Um, you, you wanna saturate it once. As soon as you start going back to your reservoir, your container, your tap and dish, uh, then you're losing control of your dose. As we mentioned earlier, this is um, very safe, but if you start losing control of your dose by adding more, adding more, adding more, eventually you're gonna get into a dangerous space. Now with eight drops, you're fine, but to be careful, we're having sort of our, our boots, or sorry, our um, uh, belt and suspenders. And uh, thank you to the Duffins for the, uh, belt and, the silver belt and suspenders they gave me. But eight drops to keep things safe, saturate one time to keep things safe, and then you're golden. Uh, you remove excess sali uh, saliva, cooled saliva, and then just roll it on, push at the high risk areas like the proximal areas and, and the pits and fissures, um, and keep the mouth open for, for about 10 seconds to allow that flow um, by capillary action and spread and wetting. Um, and then you can be done or uh, you can put fluoride varnish on afterwards. Um, so I should mention that um, Elevate, uh, like I said earlier, is gonna be introducing uh, in a couple months um, this new product called POV1. And it is literally just a dosed povidone iodine for all of, those, all of us who wanna be really safe, who wanna give this to patients to use at home. Um, and are, are concerned about the safety of, of how many drops they're gonna use and sort of the hokiness of that. So it's just, it's a simple dosed safe way to do this um, where you don't need sort of any guardrails in place. Uh, they're going to release it at the ADA event in October, um, the annual convention. So I'll show you that in a second, but, um, and then we'll have myths which we'll go over a little later. Uh, and this gives me the opportunity to say that um, in my group at CareQuest Innovation Partners, we have made a non-invasive dentistry playbook. Uh, and this is in there, and uh, we will be releasing it um, in the coming months. We're very excited about it, and there's, so there's other pages like this. The last question that everybody wants to know the answer to um, <laughs> is what CDT code should we use? Now, um, that is open to interpretation. Um, these are the four that I would say are, are sort of your options. And I would call out that um, the American Dental Association has suggested with D1355, which is uh, carries preventive med medicament application per tooth, that um, topical povidone iodine uh, is specifically called out uh, that would be applied during the delivery of a D1355 procedure along with uh, SDF silver nitrate or a thymol corhexidine varnish. Because um, they've all been shown to work for prevention I don't know about silver nitrate, um, but certainly with fluoride varnish, it works for, for Terry's treatment. Anyway, these others are options, and the 9630, I think, is a really good option for anything that you're sending home with the patient. Um, so, yeah, there's different options here. Uh, I would call out the D4381 is really for perio, um, but it doesn't actually uh, say that in the title, so, so that could be an option as well. Um, Certainly anything that you're going to dispense to the patient, you should probably document that you're dispensing it rather than applying it directly yourself. Um, and we'll get to it again, but it is, it is, very, it is a very straightforward process to give this to patients, um, especially with the product that the Elevate is, is putting together uh, for them to achieve the, the dosage frequency that really makes this work. So that was the basics and mechanisms. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about where this all came from for dentistry, for oral health. This is a background slide. This is, you know, we'll, we'll dive into some of these in particular, don't get too scared. Um, but I would just say that if you're really into Kerry's research, you gotta read the National Research Council report in 1952. Uh, you know, we're almost 70 years later and there's not a whole lot that they didn't know then that we know now. Uh, and there's a whole lot that we've forgotten. Um, but certainly, you know, the fluoride uh, epidemiologic associations were in there and the iodine ones were too. Uh, and so there was various mechanistic research on iodine and related, you know, things with iodine that showed that it could have an impact against caries. Um, but it all sort of kicked off in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s when um, following some, some rat carry studies where they fed uh, basically cooked thyroid 
to to rats. Everybody was doing rat studies and saw that the caries rate went down dramatically. And when they uh, destroyed the thyroid, uh, it also increased the caries rate. So they were thinking that it was thyroid hormones, and then somebody thought to just give the rats iodine, and their caries rate went down as well. Um, so uh, another thing is just that in oral surgery, uh, this has been done now for 60 years um, as an as a intraoral antiseptic to prevent post-surgery infections. So before you cut, um, using a scrub, some people use chlorhexidine now, uh, iodine was there first. There are no reports of side effects from intraoral use of povidone iodine. There are lots of reports of external use. There are two reports of putting it in a surgical site and then closing the site up. Don't do that. But in terms of application to the mucosa, either before surgery, during perio cleaning, all the stuff, no side effects. And it does prevent post-surgery infections, at least per the science of the 60s, it hasn't been repeated. Um, but then we get to sort of the more, more meaty carry stuff. Um, and we get sort of Tanzer, uh, Caulfield, uh, I would say, are the ones who really have led this work um, and doing some incredible stuff on figuring out that there may be a differential kill and there may be a really profound effect on kids. So that's what the next few slides will be. Um, so I, I couldn't help but put Stratton Mutans in the background because um, uh, Tanzer is, is, is a great mentor and um, probably the most careful scientist I've ever met. Uh, and a wonderful chap to whom um, all iodine carries stuff uh, should be should be an honor. Um, but he did this work in 1977. It was published in 1977. Uh, that really where he he showed that strep mutans as opposed to non cariogenic streps, um, and and the strep mutans as opposed to other oral dental plaque bacteria that do not cause caries, um, it kills it at lower concentrations and it kills it faster. So this is like they just checked after five minutes and they checked uh, and then they use lower concentrations versus higher concentrations. So um, it kills, carries bugs faster and at lower concentrations. Um, and as I mentioned, this isn't some goofball. This is Dr. Jay Tanzer. Uh, and so he didn't just do these, you know, these four bugs. He enumerated all sorts of other strains of each of all these bugs and found a perfect consistency across all these different situations. And it's Jay Tanzer. So he didn't just do these six strep mutan strains, he did like every serotype, multiple strains for every serotype um, and found uh, dramatic consistency in the kill at the concentration and, and at the time to demonstrate that in whatever patient you go to, this is going to differentially kill strep mutans. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, as I will mention, it actually shifts uh, according to 1970s and 80s technology, it shifts the microbiome uh, away from a caries uh, microbiome. Now, the mechanism of that seems to be, at least in part, uh, that it deactivates uh, glucosal transferase. Glucosal transferase is the enzyme made by strep mutans and friends uh, that goes outside of the cell, where iodine can get to it very easily, and it converts sugars into plaque, the sticky, starchy, extracellular polysaccharide uh, matrix that holds the bacteria together and the bacteria used to hold on to the tooth. Um, so it, uh, iodine specifically inhibits that. And if your eyes are starting to wander from this like busy picture on the right uh, over to the left, you'll see here that there was um, a pretty cool study done uh, where they looked at all sorts of dental products, fluoride, ethanol, uh, tannic acid, uh, some of these um, chlorhexidine uh, uh, and other things. And the only thing that showed a substantial effect on reducing the glucosal transferase activity was 10% povidone iodine. Um, so it works. It works on the bad parts of the bad bugs. So there's, there's your next test question for the boards. A uh, few years from now. Sorry, I feel a little silly today. Um, and then we're going to progress from the petri dish to animals. Um, and so uh, as we mentioned earlier, there's been some some rat studies and dental caries. I'm not uh, so proud that there's a bunch of animal testing done for our field, but there was, and I, I choose to learn from it. So um, there was one big study by Caulfield a while back, 
where he showed that this was an not povidone iodine, sort of already released iodine. Uh, turns out it doesn't work very well uh, in the mouth. It works well in rats and in a petri dish. Uh, so we choose to focus on povidone iodine, but in the lab, this works really well, this form of iodine, um, where it prevents caries in rats given sugar and stuff, um, pretty specifically on the facial surfaces, on the smooth surfaces. And it doesn't do very much in the fissures, in the pits and fissures, sulci, they call them in rats. Um, and it really differentially brings down uh, strep mutans in relation to the rest of the streps. It reduces all the streps, but differentially it, it takes down uh, strep mutans with respect to the other bugs, uh, more so than all these other things that were, that were studied. So it works to prevent caries in rats with sugar and all that stuff. And it changes their microbiome away from a strep mutans heavy uh, microbiome. Um, and there's another rat study that, that he did and he published that same year. And I'm sorry, the, the years on the lower right are wrong. That should be 1981. Um, and, and this is pretty cool. So this is where they looked at whether, um, whether you can combine fluoride and iodine and have more of an effect than either one on their own. Um, and so that's important because that's what we want to do clinically is combine therapies with the wave of a brush and uh, have more of an effect. They clearly have different mechanisms. Uh, Iodine is killing strep mutans, deactivating uh, glucosal transferase um, and fluoride we know. So uh, what happens here when you just do iodine versus iodine and fluoride or fluoride versus iodine and fluoride? And what you have that's very interesting is that you, you do reduce um, facial surfaces like we saw up here. Um, but the combination uh, reduces significantly more in the occlusal surfaces uh, than you did uh, with just fluoride, whereas iodine on its own did not have an effect. And so that's what we call synergy. So the combination of the two um, mathematically doesn't actually add up to what you see. It's what you see is even better than what you would expect uh, by math. So in the occlusal surfaces in rats, it's synergistic. Um, so that is really cool. And it shows that they are complementary and at least additive. Um, and I'll just note that the, this E and this D is, um, is this is a, an enamel lesion. This is the count of the enamel lesions. This is the DS is the count of the dentin lesions that are uh, basically in the, in the outer part of the two non-cavitated dentin lesions where you're seeing uh, you know, like radiolucency in the DEJ or just into the DEJ and the DM is in that middle third of dentin, uh, the cavitated lesions that, that deserve a restoration. Okay, so that's the rats. Um, what about clinically with the bugs? We take this to children, school age children, and we put iodine on their teeth once or twice or three times in a week. What happens with their strep mutans? And what you see here is they go out to about six months. Um, and clinically, if you look in the saliva, uh, in the pits and fissures, and in the proximal surfaces, um, the bugs go down and stay down, except for the pits and fissures, after about six months. And out to about three months, it's, it stays down and comes back slowly. Um, and then kind of the same story here, uh, they only went out to three months, but the, the percent of kids with, um, who were treated with iodine who had detectable strep mutans on a given surface um, you know, went down after treatment, what, there were none after treatment, and then progressively it came up to levels that were about half as much as they had previously. Um, so what this tells us is that there's a time-bound effect, and that as with SDF, for better or worse, we got to put it on again uh, in time. In particular, because of the pit and fissure pattern that we see here, uh, we think that it should be more frequent than every six months, and I'll just say there's other studies that have found the same thing, that if you look at six months, in the pits and fissures, uh, strep mutans has come back following just one treatment with iodine. Um, the other surfaces it stays suppressed, comes back slowly. So we think that if you have your um, application frequency at more than every six months, more frequent, so every three months, every four months, every two months, that um, overcomes the bugs. And that, that bears out in what we're about to talk about. So that was the laboratory and clinical microbiology, how this works, what the mechanisms are sort of clinically, does it actually seem to bear out in petri dishes, in animals, in humans? Um, and now for the caries stuff. So um, I will just say very briefly um, that 
fluoride varnish, we all think about it as being really effective, um, and it is. Uh, it's simple, cheap, cost effective, all that good stuff. Um, but there's there's actually not statistical significance on preventing caries at the person level, at the patient level. Um, and so that actually is the focus of the clinical trials on iodine, is are you preventing any lesions from happening in this patient, not reducing your added DMFS or DMFT, not reducing the number of new cavities that someone has, reducing the people who have new cavities. So I wanted to paint that context before going forward. Um, and here it is. So uh, I have done a systematic review and meta-analysis. I'm gonna spare you all the details, um, except to show you this ugly forest plot. Um, and so what this forest plot is, if you've never seen a forest plot before, uh, what this does is it summarizes multiple individual clinical trials with multiple patients in the treatment group and in the control group. Um, and, it, and it looks at the outcomes of those trials where this is, um, this is the estimated effect is that little blue dot and the whiskers are the confidence interval. So if that line does not overlap the line of no effect, this one, uh, then you have statistical significance. And the size of little blue square um, shows its contribution, its relative contribution to, to, the, to the math of summarizing all of them. So here's the sort of the forest from the trees. And um, this is the uh, randomized clinical trials at top. And this is the cohort studies where there's uh, comparative cohort studies. And um, those of course are much larger where they looked one year at kids, and then for the next year of kids, they added the iodine and compared between the two historical uh, groups. Um, and, and there's statistical significance overall that shows about 0.67, so one minus 0.67. So that's about 33% of uh, less kids with cavities. We're not just reducing the number of cavities, we're reducing how many kids have cavities. Um, I have not seen that for other things. Um, so. Uh, I will zone in here or zoom in here, not zone. You zoning out? You with me? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here. Um, this is this is a chart of the application frequency uh, versus the preventive fraction that is estimated uh, by by the math, by the standard math. And that you could, I hope you can see is that sort of the no more frequent it is, the the higher the effect seems to be. Um, and then these pink dots are and oh, and the the size of the dot is the size of the study, uh, the number of patients relatively. Um, and uh, the no fluoride, uh, these three groups didn't have fluoride in the control or the treatment group. So these uh, other five studies all had fluoride varnish or some form of fluoride in the treatment and in the control, and these had no fluoride. So, you know, no fluoride, you're probably going to get more cavities, uh, and the preventive effect was actually stronger in those groups. These are small studies, interesting observation, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. Um, so trying to estimate from the three studies that reported it, uh, what is the effect at the tooth level, which is what we're used to seeing for preventive fractions, um, that math ends up to be about 48% um, less new cavities. So about 33% less kids, 48% uh, less new cavities. This is with uh, what clinical trials and cohort studies, uh, comparative cohort studies have been, have been done. So, one of the questions is, why aren't, why aren't we doing this more? Why aren't we letting people do this at home? Um, let's compare this, these, these outcomes or these estimates uh, to what other preventive products we have. So I have this pet project. Um, I should mention I'm friends with GC. I'm one of their key opinion leaders, but um, I'm not a fan of MI paste because there is so much evidence that MI paste does not have any effect on preventing caries that the American Dental Association actually recommended against it. Um, I guess it was as a, recommended against it being a treatment for, uh, for, for, for non-cavitated caries lesions, but it, the truth holds. So that is a product that people sell to patients to use at home that does nothing. I am proposing that we use a different product and give it to patients, sell it, whatever it is, uh, to use at home, and we can teach them how to use it in the clinic, just like we do uh, prescription strength toothpaste, normal toothpaste, all the things. So here's how it all stacks up. 
Again, these are estimates. I'm sure in the coming years we'll have better data, but that's where the evidence is right now. Which would you use? So now for safety. This is the other big question about iodine. So we're gonna get back to this. I'm gonna remind you what we said earlier, sorry. Uh, it's a necessary nutrient and the safety profile is really clear. Um, using the cotton swab, using the HOV-1 uh, applicator, um, you're not gonna get more than a um, 0.1 milliliter or 100 microliters out of that thing onto the teeth. That's gonna be a milligram of iodine as the maximum of what would be consumed. Um, and doing that once every two months is gonna give you an average added dose of seven micrograms a day. Um, that is very safe. Um, so unless you have somebody with extreme contraindications, uh, this seems like a very simple thing to do. So what are those extreme contraindications? Here they are. If someone has already had an allergic reaction to iodine, povidone iodine, contact sensitivity, if they have already, their body has already said no to iodine, you probably shouldn't give it to them. Beta thalassemia major is this one. It's not well understood, um, but they are extremely sensitive to iodine. Don't give it to anyone who has active beta thalassemia major if you are working in a children's hospital, because um, that is where you would find these kids. Um, don't put it into a wound that's going to hold the liquid. Um, that will cause reaction in, in many people. Um, so what you don't wanna do is, is put it on somewhere and then close it up so it stays there. This is a brush on, let it dry, soak in, whatever, and then, and then go about your business. Uh, this is not to be put in a laceration, whether you cause that laceration or it happened naturally. Advanced thyroid disease with severe iodine intake sensitivity. Um, most of these people are actually really well versed on their iodine levels and they will be able to understand um, what, what risk uh, this could potentially play. Um, but of course, feel invited to communicate with your patient's medical team if there is advanced thyroid disease with severe iodine intake sensitivity. And finally, we're gonna talk about this myth. The connection to seafood allergy is a total myth that has been debunked over and over again. Uh, there is no validity to it whatsoever. Uh, it turns out that seafood allergy is caused by two different proteins uh, on shellfish uh, and has nothing to do with the fact that they also have a little bit higher iodine. Um, safety considerations, <laughs> I've mentioned this one before. Uh, allergy is overstated and mild. Um, antihistamines work if you have an allergic reaction uh, to povidone iodine on the skin. Um, I mentioned that one. Now, safety studies. This can write home about. There was a study where they uh, analyzed the thyroid hormones to look at the possible effects on hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Um, and they looked uh, once a week for a month and then once every two weeks and then once a month uh, until uh, two months after the six month period of rinsing with a 5% rinse every day. What we're talking about is using a 10%, 0.1 milliliters or 0.2 milliliters at most, 10%. Um, so the, the dosage is much smaller than the 15 to 50 milliliter rinse that you're gonna do uh, when, when you rinse. To move around, you need at least 15 milliliters which is like 150 times uh, the volume of what I'm, what I'm talking about here for putting it on teeth. No effect on thyroid hormones. Intraoral use seems to be very safe. Now, it turns out that in the last uh, 25 years, there have been a run of clinical trials to try to find something more effective at preventing mucositis, oral mucositis, um, in patients undergoing bone marrow transplant, chemotherapy, or, and or radiation. Um, and so literally, it, uh, povidone iodine, 10% or 5% or whatever other percent, has been the standard of care for um, preventing and even managing oral mucositis in cancer patients undergoing cancer treatment. So if you can use it on them, <laughs> except beta thalassemia major, 
uh, you know, you can use it on, on routine patients. Uh, there's something about intraoral use that seems really okay. Some of us know that there has to be 10,000 hygienists out there uh, using a one-to-one -one or more dilution of uh, COVID-09 iodine uh, in their ultrasonic scalers as, as an irrigant. And it's known that this really helps clean up uh, perio disease, at least short term. Um, I should say again, there have been no reports of contact dermatitis from intraoral use. And there's lots of reports of everything everywhere for this kind of thing that has been studied so carefully uh, because of its systemic effect. So that's the safety stuff. Back to the myths. So just going to focus in on three. We mentioned two of them. Uh, no, I guess just one already. So we had to draw this out because I have seen this all over the internet is that povidone iodine stains teeth. No, it doesn't. It does not stain teeth. It doesn't stain cavities. It doesn't stain healthy tooth surface. This does not stain, I promise. It will stain your favorite fabrics, your cloth, your cotton. Um, there's this thing called a starch test, which is putting iodine on paper or anything with starch. It stains it black. So be careful of paper, be careful of cloth. You do not need to be careful of teeth. When you first brush it on, the teeth will look brown or orange or whatever you call that color. Um, and basically, as soon as the patient closes their mouth, step two, and opens their mouth, step three, the stain disappears. So it's not a stain. It's, it's just the material happens to be colored, and then it gets diluted and thereby activated. So beware your cloth and all that stuff, especially as you're advising people to do this at home. Shellfish allergy we just talked about. Um, myth, bad taste. So if I were to give you a shot glass uh, or a cup of iodine to swish with, you would taste it and hit me in the face after you sprayed it all over me. Uh, if you take 0.1 or 0.2 milliliters of this stuff and put it on the teeth, you really don't taste it. This is not SDF. As wonderful as SDF is, and everybody knows I'm the biggest fan of SDF, it does not taste good. It tastes really weird. Uh, this stuff just doesn't, it doesn't have a flavor. Um, Call me if you if you feel like that that's wrong. Uh, so those are the big myths. Now we are going to translate this into a clinical protocol, and what I'm going to do is frame it in in terms of um, of our non-invasive dentistry playbooks flowchart. Um, this is beyond the scope of this talk right now, but it's it's if you have a caries lesion, this is a decision tree of where to go with this. Uh, if your lesions are not active, or maybe there are no lesions, but you have elevated caries risk. This is one of the things that you can do, povidone iodine. So if there is a high caries risk, povidone iodine. To me, uh, I think of povidone iodine just like I think of fluoride varnish. If somebody has a low caries risk, no sign of active caries, they don't need fluoride varnish. They probably don't need to be at the dentist, but if they're there, we can maintain them and reinforce all their good behaviors. Uh, we can talk about having them uh, influence others to have positive health as well. If you're thinking about sealants, you should be thinking about povidone iodine. If you're thinking about using SDF for prevention, you should be thinking about povidone iodine. There it is, so there's the thing. Uh, as a plug for the coming NID uh, playbook, um, all of these dark blue things have a page uh, in the playbook that is beautifully illustrated uh, by the team that I'm lucky enough to be a part of. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention CDT codes here. So if you have a low caries risk patient, give them that good old 601. And if they're uh, moderate, or high, they get a 602 or a 603. So please use the codes, that's what they're there for. The more we use them, the more the insurance companies will pay attention and Medicaid will pay attention to Medicare and, and things will be reimbursed based on risk after they have enough data to follow that over time. I know I kind of work for a company that's affiliated with the insurance company. Suggested frequency protocol, here it is. For mild carries risk, nothing. For moderate to high caries risk, four times a year. That's cool. And for severe caries risk, like if there's no salivary function or limited or whatever, uh, four to six times per year. Four times will make an effect. Six times, maybe it'll make a higher effect. Maybe if you look at these dots, maybe. Maybe there's something there. How do you get four times a year or six times a year consistently with for a patient? Uh, are they going to come into your clinic all the time with COVID going on and all that stuff? No. This has got to be done at home. Um, so again, that's why we asked Elevate, that's why I asked Elevate to make their product. So this can be done, eight drops, shot glass, or whatever. Uh, one side of a Q-tips swab, don't redict. That's 
the magic right there. Um, and yes, this is any 10% povidone iodine. It can be betadine. It has to be 10%, 10%. What I skipped over is that there were some clinical trials earlier of 0.5% or 1% that did not work. Uh, the 10% have all, have all shown an effect as long as you keep doing it over time. And with that, I will ask uh, Mr. Anthony to show the video of the Elevate product for all of those of us, including myself, who we'll have a hard time getting patients to figure out which bottle to buy at CVS or wherever, and uh, just give them a product that they can use and suggest. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I just love that. So uh, uh, thank you for watching that video, uh, share my screen. We'll jump back over to my, my screen and now just for a little taste of things to come. And if you're kind of uh, on the wild forefront like me, then maybe you wanna try this at home. Um, I think you'll be okay. So this is using it for treatment. Uh, based on everything that I just shared and knowing this stuff for a few years now, really diving into the data and being asked by some parents who had the insight themselves um, I have been doing iodine at home as a therapy for caries lesions um, where other things have been refused. Um, and so here's my, here's my protocol. Here's the, the Jeremy Horse protocol for povidone iodine at home. One week for a month and then once a month if there's just a few lesions. Uh, and if there's more, keep going twice a month. Pretty simple. So you can see just like do it once a month and then uh, and then if things are, you know, pretty bad, and I mean cavitated caries lesions here, um, then then maybe you want to maintain at a, at a higher frequency. Uh, I have found this to be very effective. I do not have any clinical trials behind this. I have done this clinically with people I care a lot about. I'm going to show you some pictures and then we're going to move to questions. So. Uh, oh, of course, the frequency, I'm not going to ask anybody to come in once a week for a month and then once a month. Uh, so this has got to be done at home. And thank you, Elevate, for making POV1 so that we can do this at home and I don't have to, uh, you know, have all the like weird bottles of COVID-19 around. Um, so uh, this is to show, um, these are just two patients that I have helped to uh, control the caries for, where I feel like all of their caries lesions are completely arrested. Um, in their mouth, these are little kids where the parents were not interested in putting black dots on the front teeth. <clears throat> and so I wanted to do something because I felt like per the nutrition, uh, hygiene, and caries rate that was going on with these 12-month-old patients um, when we started, uh, that I needed to do something. And um, the upper actually was a no-fluoride family. Um, and so a year later, all the lesions were arrested. I wish I had the before for you. I don't. Uh, but this is after, and you can still see some of these arrested enamel lesions, a uh, little micro cavitation here, and uh, arrest, no stain. Uh, one of the interesting things that's happened uh, in my eyes, in my practice, has been that the, the cavitated lesions have broken out to the lingual. I don't know what's going on with that, but they're hard and shiny, and it's happened um, quite a few patients. These are a few that I got to get the um, I got uh, uh, pictures for. So that was very exciting. These are 12 month follow-ups, uh, both of them, different kids. Um, so of course, you know, cavitated lesions can pick up some stain naturally when they arrest, it's a good sign. Um, and then here's some partial stain where you have some cavitation, it picks up some color. I do not believe that this is from the iodine uh, per the lack of stain in other areas that are arrested. Um, and here, this is interesting. So here we have a, you know, a small cavitated lesion um, or multiple, I guess, small <laughs> cavitated lesions which this is before and then six months after. Um, and you can see that, you know, the enamel lesions have arrested. Uh, the dendrum lesions, I think, are partially arrested and that sort of that margin is partially arrested. So either way about it, we're, we're making good progress. The lesions haven't gotten bigger. The parents are stoked, kids stoked. It's easy for everybody. Um, and finally, 
uh, this is with a cool product that Elevate actually lent me, um, where you can look at sort of like if you've ever heard of quantitative laser fluorescence, uh, this is like qualitative. <laughs> so just a view, uh, light fluorescence, right? Yeah, laser fluorescence. Um, and and in this one kiddo, I, I you know, his sister, all her cavity stuff, uh, but for him, um, it looked exactly the same when we started therapy. Uh, mom swears that she put it on all the teeth all the time. I put it on all the teeth whenever I saw him. And uh, the lesions on his left side arrested and the lesions on his right side grew all over. So, um, you know, our failures make us trust our successes. Uh, nothing is 100%. Um, and so we're still learning about this. Uh, was this a bacterial thing? Uh, resistance hasn't been seen with COVID-19 iodine or any iodine. So what's going on there? Uh, still looking into it, but that's sort of the full disclosure. It seems to be working for treatment, uh, not 100%, but for most of the time, uh, for me, it's 97% of kids um, and about the same percentage of teeth. Um, it's like 94% of teeth. Uh, we have caries arrest with home iodine use. Very exciting, very interesting, totally unproven, uh, but works in my hands. Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, that is our course on iodine uh, caries management prevention uh, with everything you ever needed to know. Um, here's my email. Um, this is my website that'll have these slides up and the course will be on the Elevate website. With that, I'll stop and we will ask for questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Horst, for a great presentation and thank everybody again for joining. Uh, to our guests, remember your CE certificate will be emailed out automatically within an hour or two. So make sure to check your spam folder. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for links to new CE. Also, uh, let's go and go through some of the questions that came in. Thank you for sending in your questions as, as the presentation went on. One of the questions that came in was actually in several different phases from several different people. Is there any issue or concern using other fluorides or silver diamine fluoride at the same appointment? Um, and then I'll follow that up with certain iodine removes silver diamine fluoride stain. Does this have any effect on that? Oh, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking that, Steve, and, and whoever gave the question, Steve. So iodide with a D um, is, is, is sort of the negative charge of iodine. Um, and so this should not remove the stain from silver diamine fluoride. Um, but in general, we don't do them on the same teeth at the same visit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. But uh, what I do clinically, uh, if I have a, a patient who's just a mess, I will, um, that's not a nice way of saying that, I'm sorry, who has a lot of lesions, active lesions, um, is I'll, I'll try and apply the silver diamine fluoride first for the therapeutic effect uh, and cover with, with fluoride varnish or Vaseline. Um, and then I'm not worried about the you know, iodine touching the silver diamine fluoride. I don't, yeah, so there's a chemical difference between iodine with an N and iodide with a D, um, which makes me feel uh, good that I'm not gonna screw up the silver diamine fluoride. Um, but I wouldn't put silver diamine fluoride on a tooth and then put iodine on it right afterwards. I would, put, I would cover it with Vaseline or varnish and then treat the other high risk teeth or, or the whole mouth uh, besides the treated area uh, with iodine. So same day, yes, same tooth without a barrier, no. Okay, very good, appreciate that. We had a few questions come in uh, asking of a comparison between this and molecular iodine. Are there, can you describe some differences between them? Well, one of the things is that one is cleared by the FDA uh, and fits underneath the monograph of the FDA, and one is entirely unregistered, you know, it's sort of this, um, um, black market um, product. So molecular iodine, uh, I've checked, uh, some of my friends have checked recently, we kind of keep tabs on it, um, is not, those products are not registered uh, with the authorities. The uh, facilities that they make them in are not registered with the authorities. So I'm optimistic about them, um, but I wouldn't be using them in patients uh, for fear of suit. Um, I think they're probably totally safe. Uh, the companies seem totally legit, except that they have products that are not registered with the FDA that are being used in patients. So um, <laughs> I don't know, it's a little awkward to talk about. I'm not trying to like, uh, you know, alert the authorities, but I would not choose to put that in a patient. Um, that said, you know, povidone, like I said earlier, it's like this 1950s, early 1950s technology. 
Uh, I'm sure that we can move forward from it. Um, and I'm sure that as a clinician, I want it, I want everything that I give or use on a patient, uh, give to or use on a patient to be, to go through the proper channels. Um, there's no safety data on this molecular iodine stuff. I mean, Lugol's solution is molecular iodine, uh, and that does not work against caries. So um, that's the potassium iodine I2 stuff that, that Paige Caulfield and them were messing around with. It works in rats, doesn't work in patients. Um, so the, they have to prove safety, efficacy, and consistency of manufacture, and they've not done any of that. Uh, at least they haven't presented in public. So I would, I would, my recommendation is to stay away for now. Very good. Appreciate that. Uh, we had several different questions come in asking about different age groups. Is there a minimum or maximum age group or a smallest patient size that would use povidone iodine product like this on? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. So um, the EPA. So so I mean, basically, twelve months and up is the short answer. Twelve months and up, moderate to high to severe caries risk. Like this is this is a great solution. Um, the under 12 months thing, which is near and dear to my heart because so many um, so many uh, children who get their teeth really early, especially American Indian and Alaska Native kids and, and First Nations peoples uh, in, in our continent, get teeth really early and have extremely high caries risk, and I want to use it on them. Uh, personally, I feel safe uh, using a small amount of iodine at any age. The reason I bring up the 12 month is that the EPA recommends no supplementing before 12 months and then supplementing after 12 months. So there's, um, there's kind of this, this caution around supplementing. That said, if you only apply enough to cover the facial and lingual surfaces when those are first erupting and then the molars when those are first erupting in really high risk um, uh, populations, um, I, I think you will be safe, but it, it should probably be part of your disclosure and informed consent um that were uh, people don't uh supplement iodine in kids at that age that said um i i have my dad do this he's got high caries risk he's 72 um you know i've talked to 110 year olds about doing this um everybody else okay thank you very much and then just to follow up on that you recommend you recommended at home or regular use of the material. Can you go through that one more time just for clarity, the frequency of application, or is it changed for high risk or moderate risk, that type of information? Yeah, and again, thank you everybody for, for joining. It's just, it's an honor to have been with you. So the, the at home uh, for prevention um, is really, it's really every two to four months. If you look in this group here, it's every two months, three months, or four months. Those have all been shown to, to do something about preventing caries at the patient level. Um, so you just got to repeat it. There's no trials at six months. There's trials just applied once and then never again, or applied a few times uh, within one month and then never again. That's this one here. Uh, maybe that works. Um, but I like to see patients as frequently as I can. Patients, you know, I'm very charming, but um, <laughs> they would rather come in once a year, <laughs> twice a year, never. Uh, so this is something that can empower people to take care of themselves by doing it, you know, four times a, a year at home. So what we do is we have a, um, a text, an automatic text with our um, practice management software that goes out uh, once a season, once every three months. Um, and I try to tell parents just say, you know, like, okay, uh, you know, August 1st is coming up. So I want you to, you know, let's write it down in your calendar together. We'll put the text too, and it'll be, you know, August 1st, November 1st, February 1st, May 1st on that kind of rhythm. Uh, kind of the younger the kid is, the more frequently I want to do it, because that's that was where these studies showed the big effect. Um, but that's kind of the patterns. It, it's hard. So so what we do in terms of like instructions for families, uh, so we say go ahead and brush the teeth like normal, the patient spit, and then lay them back into your lap on the couch, on the floor, on the bed, um, and then get the iodine. And with their head kind of up on you, uh, you brush it all over their teeth. Stay open for 10 seconds. That can seem like a long time, but when you're with little kids, you might be used to singing. So you can be the singer of the song uh, while you keep the mouth open for 10 seconds. And then they should probably go to bed like that without brushing again, without rinsing. Um, just let the iodine soak in uh, 10 seconds and then no food or drink for at least 10 minutes. 
preferably let them go to bed like that and go to sleep. Thank you very much. Uh, we're running low on time, but I think we'll do about three more questions and close up. Um, the first of those questions, uh, Dr. Enternock has asked a few times, does puppet iodine penetrate the biofilm? I think you mentioned that earlier that it does, but. Yeah, um, it's not known exactly why <laughs> other than, um, so I2 doesn't have a charge. Uh, so I3 sort of um, ha has a negative charge. Uh, I1, uh, it's just one iodine on its own, has a negative charge with I2. Um, it, it doesn't have a charge, and so that neutral uh, uh, molecule seems to be able to to penetrate in areas like biofilms uh, uh, deep into it, and then and then once it's activated, then the iodine splits off and, and interacts, um, reacts, um, uh, as we saw with the protein and DNA slide. It sort of takes um, some polarity to activate it. So part of it is this sort of partial positive charge that happens uh, here. Are you seeing my slide? Anyway. Yes, we can see that. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Um, partial positive charge that happens here from the oxygen pulling the electronegativity away from that area. That invites the uh, electrical, the, the, the polarity from the iodine into that reaction. Um, so you kind of need that activation for it to happen. So, so a big part of it seems to be the neutral charge of I2 uh, that then turns into, uh, that then reacts once it, once it encounters this kind of situation. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, can povidone iodine be used before sealants or before, um, before restorations or even art? I don't know if anybody knows that. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, the stuff is a little sticky. Uh, and so I think just in terms of the material uh, itself, the povidone, I wouldn't want to. Um, I have done it after sealants and like, you know, like went back and looked like right away because I was like, oh man, did I just like stain my glass animal and it didn't? Um, uh, nor resin, nor is it stained resin. I've done that immediately afterwards as well. Um, but I, I wouldn't recommend doing it before because of the povidone. The iodine, I'm sure, is fine. But the povidone is this sort of like polymeric, sticky stuff um, that might get in the way of your bond. Okay. Thank you very much. And we'll finish up on this last question. What is the, is there a risk of you know, offsetting the mi microbial balance in the mouth by using iodine, povidone iodine washes? Yeah, I, I don't, so there's been quite a few clinical trials of um, iodine washes or scrubs uh, intraorally in really sick patients and healthy patients. Um, and there have not been any untoward effects at all, um, at all, at all. So I think not, um, you know, like I say, that the, really the, it was kind of the seventies and eighties technology, uh, not this one, this one, um, where they were looking at total streptococci and it's, it went down a bit, but they looked specifically at, at, at strep mutans. Now, if we looked at this with modern technology of, of the microbiome stuff, would we see any unhealthy bugs going down relatively? I think that's, an experiment that should be done. Hopefully somebody who's on still uh, will we'll figure that one out. Um, maybe we'll do that with some of our collaborators. Uh, but I mean, I guess it's it's hypothetically it's possible. It hasn't been proven that that doesn't happen. Um, but the two big safety, two big types of safety studies that have been done of looking, uh, and they did a lot of blood work on these people, not just the thyroid hormones. And there was just nothing askew. There was no diarrhea or anything like that. They looked, you know, up and down at these people. Um, they were fine. These are healthy adults. That did a five percent rinse every day for six months. Um, and then again, these are these are cancer patients uh, in treatment, having mucositis or preventing mucositis. So, so my strong guess is is that you're not going to have any dangerous microbiome effect. Um, I think we have a lot of history of use. So. It'd be cool to do the experiment, but I, I wouldn't expect anything too exciting to come out from that. Okay. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for a great presentation and thank everybody for joining. Uh, the link you see at the end of the presentation there um, will give you access to our archived webinars. And finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you'll find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. 
education on the latest evidence in oral health prevention is what we do. And we're thrilled to be back at doing that, what we do best safely and helping serve your patients. Thank you and have a safe and wonderful rest of the week. Thanks so much, everybody. Great, great to be together. Look forward to seeing emails after this and uh, catching up in person after all the calmness uh, comes to us.